Hi, I'm Leslie Maddox, an engineer turned homeschool mom, and we just had our first week of our uh, 10th year of homeschooling. So I thought I'd tell you about it. Now, I'm not sure how this is going to go. Uh, this was actually a suggestion from my therapist because that's the stage of homeschooling I'm in. I'm in the stage of homeschooling where I need therapy and not just for homeschooling, but you know, it's part of it. And she thought it might be helpful for me if I uh, maybe do a little recap of each week um, in order to, I don't know, process, decompress, whatever, um, and put that on my YouTube channel. I thought it was a good idea, but I was a little hesitant to do it. I was a lot hesitant actually, uh, because I have some neurodivergence in our homeschool. Two of my kids are on the autism spectrum. I've mentioned that before. We also have a, a learning difference and you know, that's just what I know so far. So part of the stress of homeschooling for me is, is kind of all of that. And I'm not going to make this YouTube channel about my children's struggles. Um, you know, one of the critiques of a lot of people on social media, whether it be Instagram or YouTube or wherever, is uh, people, you know, the creators pre presenting things as if they're wonderful. Uh, you know, giving you the highlights reel. And I understand why people, people do that. They do it because that's what they want to focus on. You know, probably not everybody, but like if it were me, I, I can understand wanting to focus on that and not wanting to highlight our kids' struggles or, or the difficult parts of our lives. That's not fun to look at. And so then you have people that go veer in the completely different direction of putting it all out there, being transparent. And I'm really not a big believer in that, especially when it comes to homeschooling, because I'm not, I don't want to use my kids' struggles as fodder for um, creating videos. I, I don't think it's morally right um, and I don't think it will be helpful to familial harmony, uh, especially in the future if I'm just getting on here and making videos about all the tough times we've had as a family uh, or our you know really tough days. So I wasn't sure about doing these recaps. So we're gonna try it today. <laughs> and see if I can do it in a way where I focus more on maybe my own, what I think is working, what isn't working, um, and that kind of thing. You know, I, I don't even know how to say this. I, I hopefully understand what I'm trying to say. I said, I'm not gonna put my kids out there and their struggles and make everything about them and oh, poor me as the mom, you know, dealing with being a mom. Uh, it is hard, and I think that's a, a conversation to be had, but I think those conversations are better um, in person-to-person uh, -person interactions in real life. That's not the conversation I really want to have on here. I hope you understand that. Uh, but anyway, I just thought I'd give how I think this week went and what I liked about it and maybe some questions I have, you know, kind of successes and not necessarily failures, but... I mean, if, if there's a big failure, I'll, I would share it with you, possibly. <laughs> you know, after all, everything I just said, who knows? But um, things that maybe I want to work on, I mean, maybe that'll be helpful. So let me know what you think about all of this. I'm still trying to figure all this out. Anyway, so let's get back to this was our first week of homeschooling for the year. It is our 10th year of homeschooling and the beginning of our 10th year. Um, so my oldest is in 10th grade. My second son is, uh, he's just about to turn 13. So this is his seventh grade year. And my youngest is 10. So this is his fifth grade year. So that's where we're at. And one thing, the last couple of years have been really different for us um, as, or for our homeschool, because it is different when your kids get older. I, I feel like once you teach your kids to read in basic math, like once you kind of get the groove on or your groove on as a homeschool teacher, a homeschool parent, then the stakes don't seem as high. Um, but now with a high schooler and uh, a middle schooler and one who's, well, not too long from now, be kind of that middle school age, 
the stakes feel much higher because I'm thinking about the future. I have to think about the future and um, especially for a couple of my kids in order to support them as a parent, not just as a homeschool parent, but as a parent the best as I can to be able to go on and live productive lives. So it's, we, we've been going through some changes. Last year was hard. Uh, last year was really difficult as we've got, we've been going through this transition. I, I talk about this in my homeschool plan decoded course uh, where like each year can feel very different um, because our kids get older and we're in different stages of life and different things going on. Um, and the last year was our, was a really big one. Like for me personally, I felt like in managing our homeschool. So I wanted this year to be different, uh, to be, to inject a little more, I don't want to say fun because when we talk about fun in homeschool, I, I think those, you can't have some fun, but it's still school. Okay. That's my personal opinion. Uh, so I, I want it to be a little less serious but for, for learning to still happen, if that makes sense. Um, and so I really thought about it and um, especially my oldest, I really focused on finding, even though he's high school, how can he get these high school credits and do things in a way, you know, leaning more into um, his interests and making it a little less serious, but still academic um, and my younger to the way I decided to handle wanting to make this a less serious year especially for them making it less serious because until before they get to high school I thought we need to get back to some of the less seriousness that we had in when they were younger so for them even though I have said over and over again that group subjects don't work for us I thought well with these two I think I can do some things together. When I get all three of my kids together, things get kind of crazy. You know, they all kind of react off each other and it's really stressful. But I thought maybe with these two, we, we did a little bit together last year. I thought okay, maybe with just the two of them, we could do this unit study and I can work all of my or most of their schoolwork around that unit study, uh, the Mystery of History unit study. And I've shared about it in a couple of videos where I've curriculum review videos. Um, I'll just explain that we're using my younger two. I'm using Mystery of History, the volume one, which is over ancient times, uh, Creation to Christ. So it's a Christian based curriculum, history curriculum. And I'm using that as our spine. And then most everything else, geography, grammar, spelling, writing, reading, um, maybe that's it. Uh, we're science. I'm going to incorporate into that unit study. Hopefully they'll feel a little more cohesive. And um, also I wanted to get away of some of the rigor that I've injected into our homeschool last co couple years, you know, as I've freaked out a little bit about them getting older. Uh, and um, so that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, what I'm trying to do there. So because we're doing things together as a group, here's kind of the, the first big thing for us this past week, um, I decided that we needed to work together in the schoolroom. Now, I'm a big proponent of using a schoolroom because that way your schoolwork can be there. It's not all over the dining room table and all. You don't have to clean up in order to eat. Um, and also because when they get in the routine of I'm in here getting work done, once they go in and sit down, that takes care of a big part of the problem of getting started on schoolwork. Um, and also just as having all your things there instead of having schoolwork all over the place, like school related stuff all over the house. I don't want my whole house to look like a schoolroom. Um, and so we hadn't focused too much on spending a lot of time in the schoolroom the last couple of years, but I thought this year we're going to do that. And so I switched that around. I spent a long time. <laughs> cleaning up in there, going into all the cabinets and um, storage boxes and, you know, some of the shelves and all the drawers and cleaning out. I have a, an injury from all that cleanup. I, I had a white plastic crate fall on my foot. I just went to the urgent care a couple days ago because it was still hurting. No broken bones, but like I went through it to get that schoolroom ready. 
um, an issue with us with the school room recently has been that my kids are all bigger. Like my 12 year old is five, nine. Um, my 15 year old is five, eight. Uh, and then my youngest is almost as tall as me. And I mean, I'm not tall, I'm five, two. So the four of us in that room, which is just kind of your standard home office size, um, and with some of the room eaten up by built-in um, cabinetry, it's it feels a little tight. So instead of using the IKEA furniture I've used in the past for our group stuff, I have this just white round table, like dining table we got from Rooms to Go or somewhere, something cheap. Um, and so we're trying to work at that. Um, and that's been a little bit of a struggle uh, because it is smaller than what we had before for spreading out. We can't really spread out a lot. We can do like one thing at a time and then it's like, okay, now let's clean all that up and move on to the next thing. And so that's a little bit frustrating. I'm still trying to find my way through that um, because my kids are, you know, some kids are real tidy my kids aren't. So when I am saying, okay, let's clean up, like I have to like micromanage it, I feel like. And if you're doing that a few times in the morning, that's going to, I can see how that's going to get old real fast. So I'm still trying to figure out how to do this um, in a way that doesn't drive me crazy or doesn't drive them crazy, but we still get things done. <laughs> so there's that. Um, I did try to make the schoolroom neater and more labels and all so I'm really happy that's actually something that's made me really happy my kind of labeling system that I've done for the school room I, let me tell you I don't know why I didn't do this before it's like where have these been all my life and they've just been on Amazon I haven't gotten them but I'll try to put a picture in here of how I've labeled like all the drawers and cabinets and all even a couple of the shelves with um, specific labels about what's in there because for me, outside, out of mind, and if I need to tell someone, go get this thing in the schoolroom, I want to be able to tell them this is what it says on the label, not just go into every drawer. Um, because, you know, they'll go into a couple of drawers and then be like, I don't know where it is, and then I have to go get it. So anyway, I got these off Amazon. Uh, so it's, it's just on this backing, and it's a little pocket. Okay, you can see that. Can you see that better? It's a little pocket. This is an index card size, so I have that on some of them. Um, I have different sizes. I have um, these that I got for, there's three of them on this one. Let's see if I can take it off the backing so that you can see. And these actually, I've been able to reposition them so far on the furniture, so hopefully I continue. So these are this size. There's so many sizes on Amazon, like really go in and measure. But when you, if you're going to use something like this, be sure to get the size. Okay. And then there's a little pocket on one side. These are square. So be sure when you, if you're going to try something like this, that you measure the space where uh, the this little plastic pocket is going to be. And then also the space inside. So like if you're going to, if you want a certain size index card to fit in, in it, then you want to be sure that it's going to actually fit an index card because there are some that say index card, but like your standard index card, they won't fit in them. Uh, and you can cut these. I ended up cutting these index card size one, the pockets down here. And so I, I ended up cutting this part um, for some of our drawers and that worked out fine. And, and then I got these little skinny ones. Uh, there's two on here. This isn't good. So, so you see, and it's got a little pocket. Um, I got these for the drawers in our school room because there's some molding on there and needed a little skinny space. And these also fit on our IKEA, I think it's the Calyx shelves. There's a couple of cubbies that have certain things in, so I wanted to label those. My initial thought had been, well, I'll just write on um, an index card like for these index card size ones I'll just write on an index card and and uh, what I'm putting in there and that'll be that I ended up not really liking the look of that I don't have nice handwriting if some of you have nice handwriting you might want to do that 
And if you're like into scrapbooking and stuff, you that might be kind of a fun thing to do. I don't want to do all that. So I ended up going to Canva and just making labels in there. I ended up loving how it all looked. I love that it's easy to switch out. What I've done before, I think what I talked about in a schoolroom video before, what I've done before is I've printed out labels on repositionable sticker paper and then cut them apart and then put it directly on my um, drawers or cabinetry. And I didn't want to keep doing that. Uh, especially for like these square ones I got for the Ikea magazine holders, which I'll put a picture of here. That's where I'm putting a lot of my kids' schoolwork, like workbooks and stuff. They each have a couple of those. And I really like those Ikea magazine holders because they're metal and they're sturdy and they're a good size. And so every year I do that, it, I either put like their names on there or if it's just one kid using the bins, I put like what subjects I'm putting in each, you know, so I'm having to change those out all the time. So I thought this is so much better because I can just switch it out much easier. The label is much easier and I actually end up doing that first day of school. I realized I had a drawer close to the whiteboard and, st and I was putting like history notebook and supplies there for our, our uh, history work. And then the drawer next to it, which is a little further away from the whiteboard, I put whiteboard supplies. I'm like, why did I do that? So like there, as we're getting started with schoolwork, I just switched the stuff in the drawers out real quick and switched the labels and it was done. Um, so that makes me happy. And the kids have, I think they've all commented on the labels because I have so many in there. <laughs> One a little label crazy, but I don't mind. You know, it's colorful, it's pretty. Um, and it's using like blues and greens, mostly, you know, colors that I find calming. And so, and it breaks up all the white. Uh, so I think the kids have all commented on it, how they like it and how it's colorful. And uh, so those have been a hit. Uh, I think that's a big key with a schoolroom is you got to make it pleasant to be in and not just a place to park yourselves or your kids to get schoolwork done. It's got to be a place that's at least has some pleasantness because there's going to be some unpleasant things going on in there. <laughs> Everything from just struggling in a subject to meltdowns. Uh, and so if you can do anything to make it better, like do it, you know, make it nice. And so I'm really happy with how those turned out. Uh, let's see. So the label pockets, schoolroom. I also want to talk about the group work. I think I did already about how it's, well, how's it going? Um, what I said before was it's, I thought it would be okay with my two younger ones. And I still think that. So that's going okay so far. Um, I, I'm still finding my way there. If you have any suggestions for um, keeping things organized uh, while you're doing group work, love to hear it. I'm trying to keep all the things we're using during our group work, like right there together. And, you know, they have their checklist and know what needs to be done and, so they, they're they not wondering how much more do we have to do. They know exactly. So those things are taken care of. I, I think it's just more of a me moving from subject to subject in an easy, easy breezy way. But actually it was a pretty good week. It wasn't that bad. As for something that I, I have questions about for the week, uh, like I said, we're using Mystery of History. We've never used it before. We went through Story of the World, for the four volumes of that. We finished the fourth volume last year, and so this year, where I thought, well, let's do something different. I've heard a lot of good things about Mystery of History, and so I thought, well, this, I mean, it was kind of a no-brainer. We're, we're going to do that. Mystery of History, Volume 1, Ancient Times, and I was excited to get back to Ancient Times and all. Uh, it is Christian-based, which is different from Story of the World. It's more secular, and so, and since it is Ancient Times, the whole like the first week we've covered three lessons this week uh, it has been about um, creation and you know Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden that kind of thing so it's felt more like Bible study um, and which is okay I mean I am a Christian and I teach these things to my kids on my own anyway but I've just been I don't know how to put this. It's I'm caught. I'm feeling a little bit cautious right now 
um, about it. Uh, especially since like one of the things we're doing, I'm not sure if this was suggested in the curriculum because they do just suggest read aloud and um, literature and, and all to look at. And so I got this book called Adam and His Kin uh, by Ruth Beechick. And so this week I've been reading aloud and I've stressed to my kids. I mean, this is part of their literature, um, not the what, what they're reading, but um, it's still part of their literature, language art studies, even though I'm reading it aloud and I'm trying to read aloud stuff like this when they're doing some handiwork and that's something else um, where we're kind of doing our, where they do something with clay or if they're drawing something, which I'll talk about in a minute, if they're drawing something as part of the history studies uh, that they do those things. They do some kind of handwork while I'm reading aloud. So that's something new I want to focus on this year. And so I've been reading this aloud to them. And this, I've stressed to them that this is historical fiction. And the idea is, I mean, the subtitle is The Lost History of Their Lives and Times. And it's a chapter book, basically. There are a few drawings. I thought this was a nice... There's a nice drawing here of, let me see if this can focus, Cain's family tree and a little timeline there. There's a, a map back here. I don't know that we're going to read through this whole book, uh, but it's historical fiction. I love historical fiction. I, and I used to read a lot of uh, biblical historical fiction. I really love it, but I'm, a, I'm an adult. And I know, whether it's biblical or not, uh, any kind of historical fiction, whether it be a book or a TV series or a movie, I need to go and find out, okay, what was um, kind of literary license and, you know, what was in the story that served the story and wasn't actually historical and what was true. Like, think of the movie Braveheart. Like, that was all wrong. I mean, not all of it, but so much of it was not historical. But people watch it. I mean, how about The Crown, the show The Crown? People watch it and think that this is actually what happened. And then if you go and research it a little bit and realize, oh, that's not, you know, they made a bigger deal about things than they should have been. And they're just guessing a lot of stuff and maybe twisting some things. And, um, and I just think that's egregious considering a lot of these people are still alive. I just think it's wrong. Um, but anyway, that's a whole other story. Uh, it's historical fiction. It's not real. It's not a documentary. And so this is not the Bible. This is historical fiction. It's guessing what Adam and Eve might be thinking and feeling. And so I've been back and forth on it with them. And I've discussed it with my kids saying, you know, um, like this. I don't know about this. I don't know about that. And, and I think this is quite right. Uh, but then in other ways, I've been really happy with, you know, reading something like this is kind of meditative. Where it makes you think, like in the story of Cain, after he was banished, basically. Um, the author focuses on what might Cain have told his descendants? What are the stories that went down, his part of the family tree? And um, how did that affect them and their futures and, and the world at large, the community? Was he seen as a hero? Did he twist it to say, well, God's protected me, so I guess I didn't really do anything wrong like my brother, you know? Uh, so I thought that was an interesting thought process the author went through in the story. And so the kids and I talked about that a bit, quite a bit. So I like that aspect of it. But other times I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. And if it's just me, I can read through it and... I know better, but with my kids, I feel like I spent so much time to tell them, like, I'll be reading that. I'll say, okay, remember, this is historical fiction. I worry that they're going to believe things. And so then one of my kids has gotten real negative about this book because I've said that so much. And so I don't know about that. Honestly, I'll be glad when we can move on in the mystery of history curriculum to other things. Um, other topics like the Ice Age, I think we're going to be talking about next week. But as someone who's taught a lot of Bible studies and studied the Bible a lot and someone who loves Jesus, I'm still feeling a little bit uneasy about some things. I don't know. Have you used Mystery of History? If you have, let me know. I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
Um, I don't want to, I just want to do right by my kids, uh, both in their spiritual lives and in just in their general knowledge. So I don't know. Uh, I'm still working through all that. All right, let's move on from that. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out that's working pretty well is I did get these, I think, was it from Family Nest? No, School Nest. Um, I saw uh, Tanya, you know, uh, from Project Happy Home was Tanya from Project Happy Home. Uh, she uh, really loves these. I'm oh, sorry, my butt's buzzing. Uh, it's, I have my phone in my back pocket. It's not a good place for it. And there's an Amber Alert. Uh, gotta pray for that little one. Um, anyway, um, what was I saying? Gosh, I'm so distracted. Uh, okay. Tanya, she has mentioned these in, like, I haven't been on Instagram much lately, but I, I noticed that at some point her talking about these notebooks and I thought, well, let me get a couple of them. And so I did, I got three for each of my two younger boys. So I got this copywork notebook and I got the timeline notebook, the one that says BC and AD, not BCE. Um, and um what was the other one like the math book notebook um for my younger two and then also for my oldest i think i may have gone them and take a look at them on amazon they have different depending on the notebook they might have some different content geared toward that notebook so this copy work notebook oh and they come in different colors that's something i liked about them because i color code my kids I'd rather have something in their color than have it the name written on it because from like a distance I could see oh like my my youngest excuse me my youngest Gabriel he's red and so from a distance I can see that's Gabriel's he can see that's mine um th there's not a lot of guessing right so I got so his two his copywork and math notebooks are red and then my middle son he's blue so his notebooks are blue and then the timeline there's only one option I wish I could have gotten those in their colors but anyway uh, I think we just ended up writing their names on them so that's nice and the first couple pages see if I can show this the first no I don't want to show that part really but the first couple pages have this dot a dot grid so there's a few pages of that and then the rest, let me see, let me show one page that doesn't have anything on it, is lined. Let's see, boy, these is, okay, got it there. So these are lined and you see there's a place for like a title of some, what's on it for a name? Let's, I have to look at this. Oh, source, cause this is copy work. So let's see if this focuses again. All right, so like this, top line here is like for a source there's a place to put a date like the digital format of the date and then maybe a title and then line and you might be able to get different notebooks with different lines but I got these like narrow ruled ones anyway so my thought was as part of their history studies I wanted to work their cursive practice into it and um, so I got draw and write through history I think that's what it's called a couple of levels of those uh, for in order to do cursive writing practice uh, and I thought well what I'm gonna do is have them do their copy work in here you know as part of that draw right through history there's a drawing that they do and so I went through and matched up different lessons in mystery of history with the different drawings available and the different um, copy or cursive copy work available and then so like this week you could do Adam and Eve. So I thought, well, I'll just have them do the copy work in here while they're listening to a read aloud, do the drawing. But instead of doing it like in the notebook, because I know my kids get frustrated if they mess up and all that, um, I decided to just get index cards, like blank index cards of different sizes, and have them do their drawings on there. Uh, and um, at the top, put the, the date that they're putting that in um so is we're doing some review of date writing which you know I, I think sometimes in homeschool we don't do enough of the um title of the drawing or the copy work at the top and then the year although i see he, he forgot to put bc so i'll have to have him do that and then we had a discussion about how 
depending on where you look, you're going to get different dates, especially for like way back then. And, um, and how s some people believe the earth is, you know, millions of years old and others just a few thousand. And, uh, so we had good discussion about that. And so, and that'll be more date writing. Um, so I thought, well, they'll just do their drawing. And then when they're happy with, like, if they're frustrated with how it turned out, they could just get another, you know, another blank note card and start it over again. And, um, and then that way also, since it's small, they know that it's not, they don't have to fill up a lot of space. And then when they're happy with it, glue it in here and then do the cursive copy work to the side um, or around it. And so that's my deal for that. And then what you saw in the beginning here was for grammar, we're starting off with them just um, doing some preposition copy work, kind of doing the easy grammar way of learning the prepositions first. So on the dot grid paper, I'm having them just do some copy work of the prepositions. I printed out the list from easy grammar and they do like a column a day and then go back and start it over again. Um, and so that's what we're doing there. So this is going to be the holder of their copy work this year. And for however long, there'll likely be room left in here for, um, next year. I love how soft the cover is and look how pretty it looks on camera. Um, it does collect some fingerprints as you can see, um, in person, this looks a little more burgundy. This looks like a brick red there on camera. It's not really that light or bright. Um, the paper is good quality paper. So I'm pretty I'm pleasantly surprised with these notebooks. Um, I thought, should I get them spiral bound? But, you know, I think we're just going to stick with this for now. If, if it starts falling apart and one of my kids especially is pretty rough with his stuff, then I might switch it to, I might have the spine taken off and put them, do them spiral bound. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, so I'm little things like that. Having a nice, don't you just love having a nice new notebook? I just love that. You know, this is helpful for me. It's easy to think about, uh, or to focus on the negative parts of a week. And I know I'll, I'll have weeks where we'll have a lot of struggles. Um, but it's helpful doing this video where I can focus on the things that made me happy and the things that made my kids happy that way Monday which is always the toughest day. Um, I'll still have that in mind if I keep doing these videos. I'll still have that in mind that, oh, that was, um, that this was the thing that made us happy last week. And let me really appreciate that. Drop a comment. Let me know how long you've been homeschooling and uh, how your first week of homeschool went. I hope you've had great success. Um, and that you have a positive outlook for the school year. I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.